ビデオ It's weird. In the intro to the last video, I kind of implied that for the next few reviews, we would be going over anime in the 90s. After all, the 90s was a time of great change. The industry was fundamentally different going out of that decade than it was going in. Not to mention the various classic titles that endured within our hearts that still continue to be revered to this day. Anyways, the early 2000s. The early 2000s, at least nowadays, feels like a forgotten era, at least compared to the 80s or 90s. Aside from cultural touchstones such as Fooly Cooly or Standalone Complex, anime of the early 2000s appears to have slipped away from the collective consciousness of otaku in recent years. That may change in the near future, but for now, anime from 2000 up to 2004 exists in this nebulous zone. Too retro to be considered recent, yet too recent to be considered retro. That, and the fact that the majority of the anime released during this period have been considered, um, what's a good word, um, pandery? Once the afterglow of Evangelion had faded, the industry decided to take a step back from creatively told stories and focus on what the fans really wanted. Sexy dames and plenty of them! The harem genre completely dominated this period. For half of the anime that came out, story had to take a back seat so the majority female cast of archetypes could get into romantic shenanigans and sexy misunderstandings with a nondescript male protagonist. Not that the genre itself is inherently bad, I have my share of guilty pleasures, but like the trapped in another world genre of today, the harem genre was so ubiquitous at the time, it was easy to get sick of it and its tropes. We're talking about the era where the Love Hina franchise ruled with an iron fist. Coinciding with that was the emergence of a new type of adaptation, the visual novel adaptation. The medium of visual novels had existed since the 80s in some shape or form, usually as a combination of point-and-click adventure and sequential storytelling. But thanks to Konami's Tokimeki Memorial kickstarting the dating sim genre, the visual novel medium exploded in popularity. And with that popularity came a slew of visual novel adaptations, most of them based on the dating sims produced by Key or Leaf. And like harem anime, the visual novel adaptation in and of itself is not inherently bad. It really all boils down to whether or not you can create a good story with engaging characters. But can an anime that almost seems to be tailor-made to pander to the otaku subculture be that? Well, here's my answer. Conquest by a new media called Fan Comics. True world unification that not even Rome or the great British empires were able to achieve. And to become rulers of the world, we'll create a master fan comic together starting now! Unless you kept up with anime in the early to mid 2000s or late Aquapaza, Comic Party might seem unfamiliar territory to most of you. It was based around a then popular dating sim of the same name produced by renowned visual novel studio Leaf. The hook of the game was not that you could just date the cute girls, or in some versions bang, but also you had to write and sell your own doujin comics. Doujin is a Japanese term to refer to amateur self-published works. They can range from novels, to music, to video games, to his most common medium, manga. These can either be original works, or works based on existing franchises known as parody works. The plot centers around high school senior everyman Kazuki Sendo. Dragged against his will by his otaku friend Taishi to a convention called Comic Party, Kazuki surprisingly has a good time. Taishi encourage, well rather strong arms him to make his own doujin. And from there, Kazuki learns the ins and outs of making fan comics, all while making friends, rivals, and mentors out of the entire cast of cute girls, and mitigating the wrath of his otaku-hating childhood friend, Mizuki Takase. Kazuki, you jerk! So you have an anime, based on a dating sim full of cute girls, in which the central themes of said dating sim is centered around a tenet of otaku culture, and the main source of conflict comes from a character who hates otaku. 
The premise honestly couldn't sound more shallow and pandering, but let's not judge a comic party by its comic cover. In all honesty, this is one of my favorite animes, easily in my top 50s. Comic Party is a pure, pleasant surprise that I feel like should be required watching for anyone who has a creative passion. And I know y'all might be looking at me like I'm crazy, but bear with me here. Let this video answer all your questions. Now first off, I'm going to go over the less than stellar aspects of Comic Party so as to ease you in and make it not sound like I'm playing favorites here. We'll start with the biggest flaw, the animation. The early 2000s was a period of growing pains for Japanese animation because it marked the time where hand-painted cells were falling out of style in favor of digital coloring. On one hand, they did make the colors look a lot more vibrant than their hand-drawn compatriots. On the other hand, early works that used digital coloring tended to overcompensate with the way they did lighting. As a result, it makes all the characters look like they have their skin and hair covered in a thin layer of Vaseline. Another potential deal breaker for people would be the character designs. Character designs in the early 2000s, or even in the 2000s in general, are very weird to look at in retrospect. The decade can be seen as a transition period between the angular, thick line styles of the 90s to the rounder, thin line style of the 2010s. It is here in Slice of Life and Comedy Anime, read Moe anime of this era that you begin to see the changes firsthand. Eyes are starting to become bigger and rounder while still retaining some angular structure. Hair volume starts to decrease while retaining its spikiness and stylization. Noses get smaller yet appear bigger from the side view. Some of these designs during this transition period hold up while others. Good God, what's wrong with your face? Make no bones about it, Comic Party's character designs have not aged as well compared to most old school anime designs, but we could attribute this to the budget rather than the designs themselves. The pictures from the original visual novel are a lot fuller and more detailed, so naturally they would be scaled back to fit a television budget. The line work is thicker, the details are reduced, and all the girls have a group of thin lines under their faces for some reason. I don't know whether it's poor shading or just a cheap way to replicate a natural blush. These designs definitely reflect the budget and time period this anime came out of. I don't mind it so much, but to some, these designs may be dated enough to be distracted. Animation in general is fairly standard for your low-budget comedy anime of the time. Background characters only move when they have to, lots of still shots, try not to look at the characters that are off in the distance for too long. General character animation is passable, if slightly stiff. The only time the animation budget appears to be properly used is when the anime does wild takes. One advantage of having designs that are less detailed than the source material is that characters are allowed to be more cartoony. It kinda toes the line towards screwball, but there's no usage of super deformed style and they do prefer to hold back rather than indulge themselves in the wackiness. Now, since this is an anime about anime fandom, it is natural for there to be anime references. And you would be right. Enough references for the DVD box set to contain a booklet cataloging them all, and boy are there some deep cuts here. Most of the references to anime and otaku culture in general are stuff in the background, usually in the form of cosplays, posters, doujin covers, logos. It is all set dressing to firmly establish the environment of a convention hall or a cosplay cafe. But unless they are direct references to anime that Comic Party Studio, Oriental Light and Magic made, like Steel Angel Kurumi or Wedding Peach, they are going to be tweaked in some shape or form so they can fall under parody and not get sued. Whether that be changing color schemes or letters or character designs or even just making franchises up on the spot. Like it? It's my brand new costume. I'm a character from the popular game Supreme Fight King. Yeah! A powerful female fighter from China. My name is Chai Chai. Not a real thing. I checked. Other references from anime will come from Taishi, whose quirk, aside from being a loud, dramatic, proud-as-all-hell otaku, is slipping quotes from various anime into his speeches. Behold! There is a new star in the sky tonight! But references that actually involve playing out scenes from an anime franchise are actually used quite sparingly and are rarely lingered on. They are more of a wink to the audience rather than a pat on the back saying, Hey, you get this reference, don't you? The only reference that could be considered truly extensive to an almost self-indulgent degree, considering that the anime proper begins with it, is an extended reference to Leaf's other big visual novel franchise, Two Heart. 
and it's really more of a tone setter slash minor plot point, if anything. Hope you know what Too Hard is, kids, because it's going to appear a lot in this anime. I honestly have to commend the localization team for leaving even the most obscure anime references intact. On the other hand, it does raise the question of why the team would leave those intact to the point of cataloging them, while also completely Americanizing everything else about the scripts. Yes, this was still a problem up to the early 2000s. It's so baffling that Noizomi Entertainment would do this considering that this anime would appeal mostly to people already familiar with Japanese culture and customs. Honorifics are gone, yen becomes dollars, curry bread becomes muffin, yakisoba sandwich becomes herring sandwich. Bread. Emmy Oba can't stand stinky fish! Stinky fish? Mm -hmm. Though these changes aren't too bad, sometimes they could even punch up the script. For example, in the original Japanese, Emmy's nickname for you is Panda Onseniko because her family owns a hot springs resort and her glasses make her look like she has the markings of a panda. Anyway, it doesn't really hit that hard in English. So the localization staff decided to opt for the simpler, blunter insult of stupid panda. What was that? Stupid panda! Panda, 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 panda! You want to be locked up in a zoo! And it sounds way better. So the changes while flummoxing aren't exactly a deal breaker. Then again... And it would be nice if the beach had some fireworks too. Why fireworks? So I can show off my brand new Versace summer dress. <laughs> Voice acting is... passable. Sam Regal does an okay job in making Kazuki sound like an everyman. Maybe they prefer those flashier books. But it's still one of his first roles, and when it comes time for him to show strong emotion, it feels like he's definitely holding back. It can't be over! I could sell 20 copies if I had more time, but I've gotta sell at least 10! Just saying, still a ways to go before Phoenix Wright. As for the girls, they are a mixed bag. Rachel Lillis does a good job putting her misty voice to good use by making Mizuki sound properly annoyed by the whole otaku spiel. You can just draw anime art for the rest of your life for all I care! But in a way that you still feel sympathy for her. But how? I don't even know how I could help. I don't know anything at all about comic books. Lisa Ortiz shows her range in playing both the soft, motherly Minami Makimura and the cute and clumsy Chisa Tsukamoto. No interruption at all. I needed to take a break and get away for a little while. Chisa's having a bad Carol Jacobinus plays the shy Ayahasabe in a way that feels natural, but not cliche. Read one of mine, too. I would like that very much. And of course, I would be remiss to not mention Emmy Yoba, played by none other than Jessica Calvello at her brattiest. Super unbelievable! This is the great Emmy Yoba's newest issue! It's super popular, sold out super right away, and it's super awesome! As for the rest, well, Sarah Van Buskirk's performance as Reiko Haga isn't really that memorable. And Georgette Riley's performance as Yu Inigawa is, well... Listen, buddy, it says right here what I'm gonna start selling. Sure, I could jump the gun, but that would affect the trust people have in me. Hey, chump! Listen up, shithead. Now, to be fair, this was how Kanze accents were localized for the time, and she does get better as the series progresses. But man, it's hard not to feel broadsided hearing that voice coming out of that body. Kind of makes you wonder if she's out taking her smoke break in the scenes where Kazuki has to watch her booth. But the performance that makes the entire dub worth watching is Taishi. And boy did they get the right man for the job. The appointed place and the appointed time is here and now. Where are you going? Don't run from fate. For the love of all that is holy, stop pounding me. Liam Grimoire Weiss O'Brien kills it as Taishi. Easily one of his most underrated performances. The way he delivers each and every line with such passion and conviction feels so natural. Come, behold the fruits of today's labor! He could read the phone book in this voice and it would still entertain me. The fact that he is putting all this fire into lines about making fan comics is just icing on the cake. Just look at this scene. In this, he is explaining the difference between two types of printing materials and methods, but he is delivering the explanation of it as if he is reciting The Tempest. 
Of course, photocopies are cheaper and quicker, but photocopying is like sailing a motorboat into an ocean of comic books. Ours is a great destiny, so we choose the luxury liner of the fan comic world. We choose quality printing. So come on, let's go to the printer. Like, who wouldn't be motivated to draw fan art if he was the one pushing you to encouragement? Hell, I just want to stop this video right now, pull out my Wacom, and just await. Oh, I'm supposed to be talking about why Comic Party is a good anime. Never mind. So the transfer from visual novel to anime did lead to quite a few changes. One thing, there are two girls missing. Asahi Sakurai, the popular idol singer trying to hide her true identity of being a mousy otaku, and Subaru Mikage, a chipper martial artist who is terrible at fan comics to a notorious degree. Their removals are understandable, Subaru being a bonus character added to subsequent additions to the game makes her quite easy to cut out, but Asahi is unique in that she does appear in this anime as a background character. She either got cut for time, or the writers couldn't find a way to fit her into the overall narrative. Which, after hearing her only line read in the English dub... Hello everyone! I'm Asahi! Hi! Here's my button. That was a good call. The original visual novel's plot is basically that you are a college student who's making fan comics, and you just happen to date a bunch of cute girls along the way. These girls are your typical dating sim archetypes. The glasses girl, the hyper girl, the shy girl, the mill, the clumsy cutie, the tomboy, and the tsundere childhood friend. You, 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 you. The game is purely a dating sim that has the fan comic mechanic used as merely a hook to differentiate itself from the pack. So knowing this, you would expect the anime to follow suit and go for a straight harem series with the fan comic aspect used as a backdrop. And uh, they don't. Quite the opposite, really. Comic Party's narrative isn't focused on the harem, but rather the exploration of the creative process. I'm sure people in the creative field will empathize with Kazuki because we the audience get to experience nearly every part that goes into creating something along with him. Getting inspiration, sleeplessly toiling away at your creation, selling that creation, meeting with other creators, handling criticism, balancing a budget, making a schedule, managing deadlines, but most importantly, it really showcases the positive emotion one gets when you experience someone buy your first creation for the first time. I sold it! One of my books sold for the first time! Conversely, it also shows the anger and frustration you feel when another creation of yours completely and utterly fails. I was a little disappointed in your latest issue. And it all works because Kazuki is a very sympathetic protagonist. Kazuki is not just another faceless dating sim protagonist. He's still an everyman, but not a blank slate for the audience to project themselves onto. Kazuki is a high school student in his senior year who actually has very little plans for the future and overall just goes with the flow. The only thing that helps him stick out is his artistic talent that his friends and classmates all praise, but he barely seems to want to acknowledge that talent. One of the main points of Comic Party is Kazuki learning how to find his passion for art through drawing fan comics. And the way it is told is through what could easily be called a hero's journey of sorts. Kazuki receives the call to adventure via the way of Taishi dragging him to a fan comic convention. The fan comic? Convention? Crossing the threshold from the known real world to the unknown world of fan comics, Kazuki meets a series of mentors that help teach him the ins and outs of making fan comics whether they know it or not. Along the way, Kazuki is faced with trials and hardships such as creepy nerves, money trouble, and Mizuki. You, 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 you. But through it all, he is able to write and sell his first comic, signaling his transformation from directionless nobody to passionate artist. However, once he reaches this point, he is immediately brought down to earth when he takes away the wrong lessons from his mentors and causes his second comic to barely sell at all, sending him to his lowest point and his second transformation, from passionate artist to failed artist. At this point, he is all but ready to give up on art altogether, but then he slowly but surely regains that mojo, all leading up to a grand epiphany that finally cements his true passion in writing and drawing fan comics, thus completing his third and final transformation along with his hero's journey.
Although I don't think Joseph Campbell said anything about a pointless beach episode that brings the plot to a screeching halt and then is just there to build romantic tension between Kazuki and Mizuki. Maybe he did, I don't know. But the main point is that Kazuki ultimately finds this passion. And passion is the main theme of Comic Party. What helps Kazuki ultimately find his passion is seeing others with their own passions. And this is where the girls come in. Taishi may serve as the initial Obi-Wan to Kazuki's Luke, but aside from going over the basics, he operates more as a mentor who watches from the shadows while Kazuki learns the lessons on his own. The real mentors are the girls. By listening to them talk about what they are passionate about, Kazuki learns all there is to know about the intricacies of what being a fan comic artist entails. Through Chisa's passion for printing, Kazuki learns the importance of choosing the right printing materials. Through Minami's passion for organizing conventions, Kazuki learns how to balance his schedule as both an artist and a student. Even Emi Oba, whose passion only appears to be making bank off her comic, inadvertently teaches Kazuki the importance of researching other people's work and marketing oneself as an artist. Some are definitely more understated than others. Through Reiko's passion for cosplay and, and Aya's passion for comics that are more beautifully drawn and artsier, Kazuki learns that other people have different ways of expressing their passion. But I think the biggest lesson Kazuki learns comes from you. At this point in the series, Kazuki is starting to get his creative mojo back. But he's also wondering if he should keep drawing comics as a potential future path. Since Yu has been drawing comics for years, he decides to ask her for advice. And her answer is really profound. You mean you're gonna quit doing fan comics? Sure, someday. Why would you quit though? You're great! Don't be surprised, I'm just in it for the fun like you. Uh -huh. Right now, I can't imagine not drawing comics, but the time will come when it stops being fun and I'll quit then and there, no question about it. <sighs> she knows it's not going to last forever, that she may have to quit making fan comics if other obligations take precedence. But at the same time, she wants to keep drawing comics for as long as she can. And do you know why? As long as there are people out there who enjoy my work, I'll never lose the desire to keep doing it. Those people are too important to me. Even if I have only one fan left. It's definitely a romantic take on both the creative process and fan culture in general. Indeed, in the last few years, we've learned what happens when fan bases get too passionate. But not only does Comic Party not shy away from the less than savory aspects of fan culture, it also makes it clear that true passions are meant to be shared with others. Until just a little while ago, I used to think the people who were into fan comics were just a bunch of weirdos. But now I know better. They love the comics as much as the people who draw them. Like a love for books. By creating fan comics or cosplaying, you are sharing your passion with people who have the same passion as you do. It is through your passion that you can share your happiness with someone. And it's only natural that the person who discovers that she has no passion is Mizuki. The reason why she's against Kazuki being a fan comic artist in the first place is because he would be entering a world she doesn't get and quite frankly doesn't want to get. But once she sees how satisfied Kazuki is with his work, she becomes torn between her happiness and Kazuki's happiness, realizing in the process that she has no passion to call her own. But after a heartfelt conversation with Yu and after seeing Kazuki meet a young fan of his, Mizuki begins to undergo a transformation herself. He was into fan comics, and I think he was in one of those weird clubs or whatever they're called. Huh? He did his club at our school festival. He made all these anime signs, and he was wearing some crazy costume that he made. Maybe it's just me, but I think it's wrong to ridicule someone because they like something different. That's just shallow. We're just teasing. Yeah, don't you think those people are seriously creepy? I think... I think... <sighs> I think that people like that are wonderful! They're people who work really hard at something that they love, no matter what other jerks think! Huh? Huh? So why don't you just keep your stupid insults to yourself?! You not only can share a passion with someone who shares that passion with you, but also someone who doesn't share that passion with you. They may not reciprocate at first, or even at all, but they may just understand why that passion makes you so happy. Like I said, romantic take. Comic Party is idealist, quirky, and dated in its visuals, but I feel like a lot of people would really get something out of it. If you've ever drawn fan art, or written a fanfic, or composed music, or made a YouTube video, the message of this silly little anime could 
really resonate with you. Comic Party tells you that if you have an idea for a comic, go draw it. If you have an idea for a cosplay, get started on it. If you want to create something, go create it. Even if you can't create something, go support your favorite creator. Share that passion with them. There is no shame in liking what other people consider weird or cringy. So long as you know your boundaries, be proud of what you love. You know, considering how much I talked about Comic Party, I think this video speaks for itself. Ladies and gentlemen, the second comic.